Welcome, Contact Talk Radio listeners around the world. This is Doug Parks, and our show is Science for Life. I'm really glad you're with us today, and we have a topic that you're going to find absolutely fascinating. We're going to talk today with Michael Ruiz, who is a teacher of remote viewing and has done some remarkable work to bring what they call chronos, or the the opportunity of uh, viewing in time to the remote viewing community. It's quite a fascinating area. We're going to have fun. But before we introduce Michael, I want to take just a moment to say thank you to our sponsor, because every week we have an opportunity to have an uninterrupted hour with some of the coolest teachers on the planet. And uh, if you would, make it a part of your day to stop by the Spirit 2000 site, check out the links to teachers like Bruce Lipton and Rob Williams and Angangak and many of the others who are making a difference in their, in their world. And uh, thank you for being a part of our community on Science for Life. But thank you from my heart to yours for being a part of the show. And I want to welcome to the show Science for Life, Mr. Michael Rees. Michael, welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's going to be a fun hour. And I remember many years ago when I was first introduced to remote viewing, I saw it as fascinating. I actually have friends who, uh, as a result of that exposure, went on and have done some remarkable things uh uh, teaching remote viewing themselves, and it, it's a fascinating story, but I don't want to assume our listeners actually know the story about remote viewing. So would you start us off with a little bit of the history of remote viewing, where it came from, and what it actually entails? Yeah, sure thing. Ed Dames was uh, my mentor and teacher, and he was the uh, training and operations officer for the remote viewing program. The genesis of remote viewing actually was... Uh, in the mid 1970s, uh, Carol Putoff, Hal Putoff, and Russell Carr, Ingo Swan is what we refer to as uh, the father of remote viewing because it was his first, um, he's a natural psychic, and he turned his mind onto his own internal self to discover how he was able to perceive things that are in the future or outside of his conscious awareness, as we like to put it. He discovered through this intuitive process and this, uh, I, I should say, introver- introversion of his mind, the process that was going on, and he made a step-by-step protocol. Now, the Department of Defense was, was very interested in this at the time because the Soviet Union in the 1970s was spending millions of dollars researching what it called psychoenergetics, which is a uh, you know, telekinesis, psychokinesis, mind reading, things like this. Our side figured, well, if they're doing it, we have to do it. So they commenced and started, you know, interviewing psychics and looking for people who apparently had psychic ability. Out of all the psychics and research that they did, uh, Ingo Swan's version of this is what came to be known as remote viewing, is the only one that actually had any results, results that were above the typical standards, above chance. They created a Department of Defense project called Centerland. And then that became Girl Flame and eventually became a black ops project called Stargate, which uh, involved military intelligence agencies. The military used remote viewing from about 1980 till about 1993 or so. And it was used at all levels of government. Jimmy Carter, uh, I I don't know if anybody remembers the Iran hostage crisis, but remote viewers in the military remote viewed the location that needed to gather intelligence about where the people were being kept and it be found via this skill that two of the hostages were not being held in the same area as the other, I think, 50 or so hostages. They were being sequestered somewhere else. And it was this piece of intelligence that they were able to give to our negotiators and let them know that, hey, we know that you have two of our people sequestered from the main group of hostages and we want them back as well. So it, it, it's an application, it's a tool that produces real world. Uh, we've used it uh, in our in the remote viewing consortium, which is, is my uh, a research and development organization. Well, it it is a fascinating area, Michael, and where where history is, um, you know, the use of this skill in the military is is of interest. 
I think what our listeners are looking for is uh, more information about how this can affect their lives, how learning these skills can open up their intuitive abilities. And um, Because I understand this is actually teachable to many, many people. Are, there, are most people able to remote view with uh, instruction, or what's your, been your experience? If anybody can remote view. It's actually a... Um it's a built-in capability. We all have this capability. Now, of course, it's also a skill because everybody has the capability to, for instance, learn how to play piano or guitar, but not everybody is going to be a superstar. But it's an, it's an inherent skill that all humans are capable of learning. In our research, we discovered that it is actually a holdover from our very primitive distant past. For instance, as an example, our ancient ancestors were walking around the uh, tundra or the forest in time, they would need to be aware of things that were outside of their conscious awareness, immediate conscious awareness, so that they could know that they shouldn't walk down a particular pathway because there would be a intuition. Uh-huh. It's like intuition in that we all have that sixth sense, like that instinct. And what we do when we train people, it's, it's like training them to have this razor-sharp gut instinct. Now, from a practical standpoint, what this does, uh, for instance, my, myself, there's a special uh, way to target things. Uh, we could do what we call optimum trajectory. So we can do an optimum trajectory for somebody's health. And the data that we can get back from that can help them to, uh, well, in my case, out what cures there were for my allergy. Mm-hmm. Well, there is no cure for my allergy, but there are some treatments. So I was able to find a particular mushroom, believe it or not. I actually drew this picture of a mushroom. I had no idea what it is at the time until I started researching. And I drew this mushroom. It was a red ricey mushroom. So drinking red ricey tea actually helped my allergies go away pretty much. So that's just like a practical application of the the kind of information that people can get by remote viewing. That's pretty pretty interesting and and also quite remarkable that this has been refined to a teachable science because yeah. uh, that is, we all know of people who have intuitive skills or people that seem to be more connected uh, than the average, but to have a protocol that enables anybody to uh, develop these skills. Tell, tell me about your story. How did you come in, into the world of remote viewing and uh, Tell the story about how it uh, impacted you and why you, you became a teacher. Well, I, I first heard about remote viewing. I was listening to a, another radio show called Coast to Coast AM, and Ed Dames was on the show. And uh, well, to be honest with you, I'm a skeptic, so I, I didn't believe it. I thought it was kind of neat, interesting, but I, I didn't believe it. But over time, uh, you know, your mind opens up to uh, various concepts and ideas. And he was on again. So I, I, had a, I had some extra money, so I decided to buy a DVD course. The, the initial impetus behind my wanting to become involved in the remote room was because I wanted to be able to capitalize on future events. And, and for many people, actually, that, that's the reason that they get in. But over time, that changes. Remote viewing changes you because it lets you know how interconnected things are. Because things really are interconnect, interconnected at the very fundamental level of reality. It's quantum mechanical in nature. But that's what got me into it, is the, the prospect that I could remote view future events and capitalize on it. What kept me in remote viewing was just the cornucopia of information that you can discover, and, and, and not, it, it's not, not junk data, it's not hearsay, it's not probable, it's, it's actual fact. You can remote view things, and then you can later on verify them by actually going to this place that you remote view, or doing some research and finding out that science actually supports what you remote view. So we, we've discovered many things that uh, correlate to the remote viewing data, for instance, that we use in the development of Chrono. We had to explore time. So it's the information gathering prospects that, that keep me in remote viewing. And then, of course, teaching people is, is always neat because we've done some workshops in the past where, you know, you get 20 people into a room 